so I'll, I want to take a polytope P, um, which I assume to be four dimensional, sitting in a Euclidean space. And I'll consider the following function. Okay. Um, so the function is um, given a point in IN. Um, I'm going to take the volume of the um, due of the translation of this polytope by the vector x. Um, and um, so what, what's the due of a, a polytope? Um, so if I have a polytope uh, Q, then Q uh, due is the set of points uh, Y such that the inner product of Y with X is less than equal to one for all X inside Q. Um, so, so I want to make this definition, I want to make this definition of this function when X is in, in the interior of the polytope. Um, um, so when X is in the interior of the polytope, then the dual is another polytope, the dual polytope, and I'm going to calculate its volume. And this, um, and this function is going to be a rational function, and I'm going to extend it by um, analytic continuation. So it's defined in this region, but it's actually a rational function. And so my talk is about um, sort of generalizations of this, this kind of function. So let, let me just calculate this function for you for, for an example. Um, let's take P to be uh, uh, a, an interval um, sitting inside the real line. Um, if I pick my X to be somewhere over here, then, and I translate, then, um, the this is my polytope P minus X, the translated polytope. Um, uh, now I want to calculate the dual of this polytope and the dual of this polytope um, uh, has uh, sort of the endpoints are one over A minus X and one over B minus X. And the volume of this guy, so this is P minus X due. Um, and then the volume of this is this rational function, which is, uh, so this, so it's one over B minus X. Um, and I want to take the negative of this, one over X minus A. Okay, so the, the volume is just the total length of this interval. Okay, so this is uh, so this this function will be a rational function of degree n um, if this is a full dimensional polytope. Um, so uh, so since this is OPEX, so um, uh, a variant of this construction. Let me mention right away. So I won't say much about it, but actually, in some of the applications, this is the thing that naturally appears. A variant of this is you give me a collection of polytopes, or maybe even. Um, convex sets. And I'm going to consider the following function, which is volume the volume of the dual of the Minkowski sum of those polytopes, where the Minkowski sum is taken with some parameters of your choice. And this again is a rational function in the X's. And it should be compared to uh, the mixed volume, the volume polynomial that appeared yesterday in June's talk, uh, so, which is just the volume. Um, and so this, this function here is, uh, is basically a special case of this. So if, if you take P1 to be P, and these guys to be the negative basis vectors, um, then you will recover this function when you substitute x1 is equal to one. Okay. Um, so I won't, I won't say much about this. So, so the, the talk is mainly focused on the, this, the function of that type. Okay. 
So where where does this where do functions like this come from? So, um, uh, so I'm going to I'm going to set up a rather general setting um, where we get functions of this type, and and they'll they'll come up even in places beyond polytopes, and that's that's the reason for the formalism that I'm going to introduce. Uh, so this is the formalism of so positive geometries. So. So there's, there's sort of a, a few definitions to give. So X is a um, projective variety over the complex numbers, irreducible. Um, and you can just think of this as projective space. That's one, one of the main examples. Or, or Grismanian or flag variety. And inside here, um, we'll take a, um, a subset that we'll declare to be positive, and it will be a semi-algebraic set. Um, so semi-algebraic means that it's cut out by um, equations and inequalities that are given by polynomials. Um, uh, so I'm going to make the I'm going to make a simplifying assumption that this uh, this thing is equal to the closure of its interior. So in particular, it's going to be full dimensional in in the real points of here. So it's equal to take the, the interior of this, and then you take the closure. Um, the the interior I'll denote by just x greater than zero. Okay, and I'm going to assume this. Let's assume that this. Oh, yes. An oriented manifold. So um, the kind of thing that I have in mind is say this is projective space. Maybe this is a triangle. So if this is P2, this could be a triangle. This is the interior of the triangle. So the so the definition is this pair is a positive geometry um, if either sort of it's it's defined inductively. So whether something is a positive geometry is defined inductively. So um, either d is equal to zero. So dimension d, d equals zero, um, and and you just have a point. Oh, I should I should say that this, so this is, um, a com I think of it as a complex variety, but it should be defined over the reals and it has some real points. Um, so this closed semi-algebraic set sits inside the real points of my complex variety. Um, so, um, so I could take just the point, um, and that is that is one option. And and if it's a point, this guy, um, the interior is just itself, and it um, and it's an oriented manifold. There are two orientations, and depending on the orientation, I'm going to make it sort of. Uh, I'm just going to define the following um, function. It's just plus or minus one, depending on the orientation of the point. Yes. So the question is, are the real points the risky dense? So, uh, yeah, so I, I assume, um, I assume, so this is irreducible and I'm assuming that this is an oriented manifold and um, because it's an interior, this is the same dimension as this. So there's an oriented D, there's an oriented D manifold. So, so it's the risky closure will be D dimensional. Since this is irreducible, it is the whole thing. Any other questions? Okay, um, and so I mean that's just that's just my uh, base of the induction. So so if the if the dimension is positive, then the requirement is a recursive one. So every component
of the boundary Um, is a D minus one dimensional positive geometry. Um, and there exists a unique rational D form omega, which I do not like this, um, on X. Um, with the following properties, um, with uh, simple poles along each of the boundary components, no other poles, um, and the following um, sort of the, the main condition, the following recursion. Um, if you take the residue on a boundary component of this form, then you get the uh, form of one degree less and it should be the form of the positive geometry, um, the boundary. Okay, so let, let me go through, let me go through this, this definition. So, um, so when you, uh, how do I take the components of the boundary? So if I'm, um, uh, if I have a triangle, um, then the, then this is the interior. The boundary is just the outside of the triangle and has three components. So that, then there'll be uh, three components there. So I want to check a condition for each. So um, for the triangle to be a positive geometry, which it is, I have to check that this is a positive geometry, this is, and this is. And each of these should come with a one form. So a positive geometry will come with a, a form that's called the canonical form. Um, and the form has the same, uh, has the same degree as the dimension of the space. So this is a top form. Um, rational means it's meromorphic, but, but algebraic. Um, so it's, uh, it could have poles. And, and the condition is that the, pol the polar structure of this form completely matches the um, combinatorics of this uh, space. So that, that's, the, that's the sort of short version of this part. So the poles appear exactly at the boundary and there are no other poles. Yes, so, right. So it, it is important sort of uh, philosophically that omega isn't uh, additional information, but omega is something that, that can be derived from the geometry of known. Yes, so there exists unique D form that does something, and this D form is called the canonical form. Okay. Um, and so, so the the last condition is the is the actual recursion is if you give me this D form, um, and I take the residue, I will get a one form, and the one form should be should be the canonical form of the corresponding boundary component. So residue means what uh, we learned in complex analysis, um, but just to uh, just to just to remind you. So what what so in this setting of rational forms, taking residue is very easy. So if I wanted to take um, sort of residue at x equals zero of let's say one over, so this is the kind of thing that would might uh, might appear in such a calculation. Um, if, I, if I want to take the residue of this, I peel off a copy of dx over x, and then I substitute x is equal to zero into the rest. So, um, I guess to be clear, dx over x minus zero, I peel this off and then, and then um, substitute So this, this thing is one uh, dy over y. Okay, so it, it's the, the residue, you can define it sort of doing a uh, sort of Cauchy integral, but it is a purely algebraic thing. Yes.
um, um, right. So, so there are certainly examples. Yeah. So Frank is saying that um, there are certainly examples that are not defined over Z which work. Um, but uh, I guess I guess maybe the question is, do I have um, classes, large families of examples that define over Z that represent all the phenomena that I'm interested in. And I think, um, I think the answer um, may be yes. Um, I'll, I'll have to think a little bit more about some of them. So I will show a, a list of examples and, um, and we, can, we can discuss whether they're defined over Z. Yes. What is X divide? How do we get a complex projective variety after taking the boundary of the geological X set? Thank you. So the, the, the question is, how do I get a complex algebraic variety out of taking this boundary? So what I do is I take this boundary. Um, the boundary of this is just this thing. Um, I then take the Zariski closure of this. The Zariski closure of this is the union of three lines. Um, let's do it over here. Uh, so. Um, so though that's x1, x2, and x3. I take each irreducible component of this, intersect it with that, and that's x1 greater than or equal to zero, x2 greater than or equal to zero, and x3 greater than or equal to zero. Did that answer the question? Is it? The question is, do I want the positive part to be connected? I'll uh, for most examples, the answer is that's um, that is connected, but uh, the definition of positive geometry doesn't doesn't need it. Yeah, and and in fact, uh, one basic lemma is that a disjoint union of positive geometries is again a positive geometry. Okay, so uh, let me give some. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go back over here. Let me give some examples. Um, okay, so I can, I can actually reuse this. So, um, so, so the first example is um, any P sitting inside Rn, if you then put this inside Pn, um, um, so you put your Euclidean polytope in and think of it as a projective polytope, then it is a positive geometry and, um, uh, and the form is this form. So I, I'm abusing notation a little bit um, by only writing the positive geometry and not the ambient variety here. So I'll come back and, and discuss this, uh, this formula uh, a bit later, uh, but that's the, that's the basic example. Um, there's another example which is maybe sort of even easier than this is you can take uh, for an integer polytope you can take um, a toric variety and its non-negative part um, and that's also an example of a positive geometry so what is the non-negative part of a toric variety a torus uh, the, the a toric variety has a dense torus um, uh, the um, the tor that dense torus has some real points, and then you pick uh, you pick one of those positive. Uh, you choose one of the connected components and declare it to be positive. So just r greater than zero to some power, and then and then that's the in that would be the interior, and then you take the closure. And it's known that the um, closure, so this non-negative uh, part of a toric variety, is known to be um, sort of stratification um, homeomorphic to the polytope itself. And in this case, what's omega? Omega is this guy has a dense torus, and this guy has a dense torus, and you just take sort of the um, the obvious form that's um, regular on the torus, but blows up at the boundary. And this will have simple poles at the boundary of the toric variety. In many ways, this example is actually easier than this, than this example. Oh. Oh, another case, which is sort of 
the maybe one of the motivating um uh the the motivation to make this make these definitions is we can take um the totally non-negative Grassmannian. So we can take the variety to a Grassmannian and the semi-algebraic set to be the total non-negative Grassmannian defined by Posnikov and by Lustig. And this, uh, so this satisfies all the things that I've said before. And, and um, I won't go into the details, but I think maybe some of the talks have that this has a stratification um, and we understand the combinatorics very well. Um, uh, what is the, what is omega though? So omega can be defined in a number of different ways. Let me first give uh, a version of omega that's sort of the most uh, elementary that doesn't require knowing about, um, uh, knowing about many theorems about this. Um, so, so one option for omega is you can take, so you take, so I'll write down the notation first and then explain. So we take this uh, K by N form of matrices and do this somewhat mysterious thing of quotienting out by GLK. And then we divide by uh, we divide by um, the cyclic minors of that matrix. So, what exactly am I doing? Is uh, I'll just give this. I'll just do this recipe in an example. So this is k equals two and n equals four, and this is the open Schubert cell inside the Grassmannian. Since I'm trying to tell you a rational four form. I can tell you what the four form is restricted to here and um, analytic continuation will tell you what it is on the Grassmannian. Um, so what is the four form on here? I'll just take, uh, so the four form um, on so omega on here is the form, is a four form. So it's, um, so what this thing at the top does, if we gauge fix in this way is you just take the obvious four form um, on these coordinates. So DA, DB, DC, DD. Um, and then we divide by these polynomials and there's going to be four of them. So it's the, this minor, which is one. Whoops. One over this, so it's a one. Then you take this uh, minor here, which is minus A. Then you take this minor, which is AD minus BC. And then you take this minor, which is D. So that is the... Um, that is one formula for the canonical form of the totally non-negative Grassmannian. Um, another formula, um, and um, this is this is a really um, uh, maybe this is the, the quickest way for the for the experts to know about cluster varieties is that the Grassmannian is a cluster algebra, and um, so. So you take, so the Grassmannian is spec of some cluster algebra. And what we just do is we take, um, we take the natural form on the cluster torus. So omega is just psi where these xi are cluster variables. So that's, that's option two, if you know about cluster algebras. And, and option three is, I don't know how much this has appeared earlier in the conference. Um, if you know about Posnikov's playback graphs, then there's, a, there's yet another way to do it, which is very, which is sort of in some sense similar to this, but maybe more combinatorial, is you can take a, a playback graph representing um, the Grassmannian. For example, in this case, um, I can take something looking like this. And then I take some subset of edges that parametrize the Grassmannian and you could choose maybe these edges. Um, uh, and then the, the form omega is the D log form on these. So it's D alpha over alpha. Um, so I'm being a little bit um, sloppy about signs. Um, 
there are lots of sign issues, which I'm going to ignore. So, Yes, Frank's question is, can I drop the projective assumption on the toric variety case or more generally on uh, positive geometry? And, um, and I would rather not because if I, if I remove some of the, if I remove some of the pieces, I may not have control of the um, singularities at infinity. So part of the um, intuition we have behind a positive geometry is that the, um, the polar structure uh, consists only of simple poles. I don't want to approach um, any pole to, at order two. So there's some danger that there's, uh, there'll be something I don't like happening at infinity if we, if we worked on an ambient variety that's not projective. But there may be, um, that's, that, that's right. Um, so we, we do know that it's all simple pose in the toric case. Yes. Yes. Maybe you said this once, but this is in your talk. You were saying that the mutation does not change that topform. Vic's question is whether uh, mutation will change this top form. And the answer is this is well defined up to sign. And you can just you can just check it by mutating. And, Okay, um, another example, which uh, I think for interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to define fully is we can also take the um, projective variety to be M0 N bar, um, um, Dillian Mumford Knudsen uh, compactification of, sort of um, N pointed rational curves, stable curves. Um, and then what we can take as the positive part is we can take, so the open subset of this M0N, which is the configuration space of N distinct points in P1. Um, we take the real points of that and we take one connected component and we take the closure. And that's a choice of this. So this guy is closure of component of M zero and R. And in fact, any, all the connected components of M zero and R are isomorphic. There's an action of the symmetric group and that commutes the component. So it doesn't matter which component we take. Um, so this is, uh, this is also a positive geometry. Um, the, the omega looks something like, um, since I'm not I'm doing this really sketchily, Look something like this. So if if the zi's are the coordinates of my endpoints, then there's a formula that looks something like this, without going into details. And um, there, are, let me also give some uh, examples which are sort of low dimensional, and we can ask. Um, well, let me first say so. In zero dimension, um, there's only one option, but there are sort of two orientations. So there's the point. In one dimension, um, it, it has to be on P1 um, and it can't be on higher genus curve. And you can't pick a higher genus curve because of the requirement that the form is uh, unique. Um, so on an elliptic curve, there's a holomorphic one form. So that will always ruin the uniqueness. So it will always be on P1 and you can, and the positive geometry will be a union of closed intervals. What about P2? Um, so what kind of uh, things can you put here? And um, uh, we don't have a classification, but first of all, all the boundaries have to be rational curves by 
by the recursive definition. Um, so it's some region, uh, region bounded by rational curves. So you can certainly get polygons, which are those examples. Um, you can also get, uh, let's say, you can take a conic um, and you can take half a circle and that's uh, legal positive geometry. Um, and um, uh, there's a recent very long paper studying a class called polypose, um, planar polypose studied by, um, so I, I won't write down all the full names because the, there's a long list. Possibly the, there's only one paper with this list of, uh, this list of last names. Um, <laughs> Um, so they, they study planar polypos and, um, and I'll just draw some of the pictures of the, some of the positive geometries that um, they have. So example, examples of the class studied here are intersection of the interior of two um, conics. There's this one that um, you can take this uh, nodal, nodal rational curve called the ampersand curve and take one of these regions and it'll be a positive geometry. Um, you can take, you can take a parabola and a cusp and intersect them and take a region and that's a positive geometry. So it's going to do quite a lot. Um, Yes. Um, Alan asks. Um, uh, Alan asks about the zeros of the canonical form, and that is um, a really good question that I'll address later. So oh, I will spend quite a lot of time on that. Yes. 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 Jake asks, uh, "How do I do this PGL two? Uh, I I fix my I fix three points with zero, one, and infinity, and and left over. Th there's a question of what happens if in the denominator you see infinity, and that factor is just omitted. Yes. Frank asks whether all positive geometries are rational varieties. And uh, certainly the intuition is that they're similar to rational varieties. The definition asks for a unique top form of satisfying some properties. And uh, so it has geometric genus zero. Um, I, I, think we, I, I think we have examples that are not rational, but they're kind of contrived. Um, so we take some, you know, uh, cubic, uh, cubic threefold. Oh, um, I think I'll, I'll have to, I have to think a bit about it. Um, whether, whether we know that that is not rational, but, but there are some contrived examples that didn't occur naturally that, um, that work and, um, at least are not obviously rational. Um, so, so, uh, open problem, um, is, uh, find more, find more uh, positive geometries and, or even uh, if you're super ambitious, try to classify them. Um, and so far it's really only dimension one that we have a, we have a classification. Um, so some, some explicit, uh, I should say some explicit conjectures of, um, places where we might find more positive geometries. Um, uh, so uh, one, uh, one sort of large class is, um, uh, we sort of expect that if you give me a cluster variety, then there should be, I mean, there is a canonical form for a cluster variety, but a cluster variety is not projective. Um, so what we hope is that if you have a, give me a cluster variety, it can be compactified to make a positive geometry. And also a cluster variety, it has a canonical form and it has a, a positive part. So it has sort of 
um, the ingredients, but it's not compact. So compactifications of crossing varieties. And there's multiple ways you can interpret this question. Uh, one, uh, one motivating uh, conjectural example is something called a Grassmann polytope or a more special case, an amplitohedron. Um, so, um, so let me give you the definition of this object and the conjecture is that it is a positive geometry. Um, so so the, uh, the definition is we, we take a map um, and the, I'm following the, the conventions that came originally from physics. So there's some weird choices of letters here. Um, so, uh, so we're going to take a linear map from R to the N to R to the K plus M. Um, and that induces a map between the corresponding Grassmannians. So, which takes a k-dimensional subspace and hits the k-dimensional subspace with z, and that will give you uh, usually a k-dimensional subspace in the, in the target space. So you take a v and you send it to z. Um, however, um, this may not be k-dimensional if uh, v intersects the kernel of my linear map. So this is only a rational map. So, this, so a Grassmann polytope, yes, defined to be, um, so P um, is defined to be, uh, we take this uh, Z sub uh, Grassmannian and we, uh, and we hit the totally non-negative Grassmannian with it. Um, and assuming that this is, assuming that this is uh, well-defined on all the positive points, then the image of it is some subset inside another Grassmannian and the conjecture is that this is a positive geometry. And um, uh, a special case, the amplitohedron case, corresponds to choosing um, this, uh, this Z map to basically also be a totally non-negative, um, this to be a positive matrix. So all the maximal minors of this are positive. So that's the a special case of this construction. Uh, uh, Sergey asks, what is the canonical form for this example? Um, so we don't have a formula, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about next. We don't have a formula for the canonical form of these examples. The best, uh, the, in the amplitohedron case, the canonical form is essentially the um, super yang mills amplitude, or at least conjecturally, um, possibly, uh, uh, possibly close to being proven. Um, and the, um, and so we don't have a closed formula for the canonical form of, of an amplitohedron, um, but there are techniques to try to get it. So this is the, the next topic. Oh, let me also mention that there's also some spec there's also some speculation that if you take a quiver variety, there's also a positive part and you can play this game as well. Um, so uh, let's move on to the next step, uh, part is um, can we find formally for the canonical forms of uh, positive geometries. Um, and so actually, let me just say it that that's the problem so. Um, find formally for omega. So omega is defined by this recursive condition, which seems extremely um, difficult to, to get your hands on or to understand. Um, and in the case of a projective, uh, a projective polytope, so, so P polytope, um, uh, so I already told you two ways. One is, 
by the recursion, the theorem says that there is a unique there is a unique form that satisfies recursion. And the second way is to take the volume. So let me just write it again. So omega of P is you take the volume of the dual. Um, there's, uh, there's another way, um, which is actually pretty easy to prove. Actually the easiest way to prove that um, a polytope is a positive geometry is to use the following formula of, a, of the canonical form is if you take P and you subdivide it or, um, well, let's just do a special case. If it's, if you have a triangulation, um, then, uh, then the, uh, then the canonical form of the polytope is the sum of the canonical forms of, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the simplices that contribute to a triangulation. Um, and these, uh, these canonical forms are much simpler. And so I think I can answer Alan's question from earlier. So if you have a simplex, then it turns out that the canonical form um, has no zeros and only has poles. So up to a scalar, the canonical form of a simplex is just determined by the location of the poles. And, you, and there's, no, um, there's no additional, uh, I mean, there's a scalar of information left in the canonical form. Um, so, this, so this is actually, um, this, is act, this actually gives a somewhat non-trivial identity for the volumes of duals. If you, if you take this formula and substitute into here, it gets something slightly non-trivial, but it is actually, you can check it for the example for an interval and it's actually easy to see. So in my example, in my interval example, B, A, um, the canonical form is uh, minus A minus one over X minus B DX. This is my canonical form. So first of all, you can check that the residue is going to be one here, here, and the residue is going to be minus one here that you can just calculate from this form. But also you can see that this form will telescope if you add two, if you take two intervals that are that you join end to end. Okay, so that's the that's an example of this formula. Um, so let me mention. Uh, let me mention, um, so I actually have a list of a few, but I think uh, I'll only mention the, um, the following one. Um, if you take the canonical form of a polytope, um, what I said earlier is if it's a simplex, then you just need to know what the poles are. Um, if it's not a simplex, then there's a question of where the zeros are. So, so um, because, uh, the recursive definition asks for simple poles at the facets of the polytope. So you can write product over F, which are the facets, um, uh, and then a linear function that cuts out the facet. So I'll just write F here. Um, so those are the poles and there are no other poles and the poles are simple. So this is what, this is what the denominator looks like. Um, I'll just write DX. I'll think of it uh, in Euclidean space. Um, what does the numerator look like? Um, so the numerator is something called the adjoint hypersurface. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just tell you what this is in, a, in an example. So let's suppose we, um, okay. Let's suppose our polytope P is a quadrilateral sitting inside the plane, my P. Um, and so, uh, right, so, so, let, let, so I'm looking for a two form on P2. I'm looking for a two form and I know that, I know that it's got four denominators. So it's, it's something and then there's sort of the four facets. Dx, dy. So this is what it looks like. Um, so uh, because we know what the canonical bundle of P2 is, we actually can predict the degree of the of the numerator. So, uh, so there's just a basic calculation that says that the numerator has to be degree one in this example. Um, so this thing is a line. And which line is it? Uh, it turns out to be um, 
the line um, that you get by extending the opposite sides of the quadrilateral until they intersect. They'll, they'll intersect inside P2 if they don't intersect in the Euclidean plane. Um, and then that will give you two intersection points. And then you take the line that passes through. This is, this is L and L is sitting in the, in the numerator here. And there's a constant that's annoying to fix. Um, so this, uh, these two points is uh, called the residual arrangement and um, uh, Kahn and Ranestad uh, proved that there's a unique um, hypersurface of the correct degree that passes through the residual arrangement for a polytope that's in generic position. Uh, for a polytope not in generic position, there's sometimes um, some ambiguity in the choice, uh, and, um, but you can get the correct hypersurface by taking a limit from generic polytopes. Okay, so, so the, 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 the problem that I mentioned is find formally for omega, and in the case of a polytope, these are some of the formally, I have, I have a few more. Yes. Okay, so the, the question is, uh, in, this, in this formula, this is only defined for the, if X belongs to the interior of P, but here, uh, this is not how I think about it. And the, the answer is that um, this, uh, in the interior of P, this is a rational function. And I consider this, I extend the domain of this rational function, um, even when X is not in the interior of P. So when X is not in the interior of P, there's a well-defined value, as long as you're not sitting on a pole, there's a well-defined defined value, but it doesn't have an interpretation as a volume when, you're, when X is outside P. And, um, and this identity is an identity of rational functions, basically. And this is how, if, if you try it for, if you try gluing two intervals together, um, this is how it, it works for, for, you just, uh, you're just adding two rational functions. There's actually no point that's simultaneously in the interior of, uh, of these intervals. Uh, Alex asks, am I taking analytic continuation? And the answer is yes. Yeah, so, so Frank, is, uh, Frank is explaining something that he didn't explain properly is that the, the, um, the interior of the polytope is uh, Zariski dense in the host space and therefore the, it uniquely de determines um, the rational function on the host space. Okay, so, so uh, a specific part of this problem is to get some of these formally to work for some of these examples or some of these conjectural examples. And in fact, this sort of the motivating example, which is the amphitrahedron, um, unfortunately, the, the recursive definition is something that um, we cannot get to work because we do not how to know how to classify the, um, the boundaries of the amphitrahedron or other Grassmann polytopes. Um, and, um, and uh, what we end up doing is we use, this, uh, we use this formula. So we try to triangulate the space. Um, this hypothetical positive geometry, we, are, we try to triangulate it. Um, so, so that suggests the question, do, do positive geometries have triangulations? And um, so what is, a, what is a simplex, what is a positive geometry that is a simplex? Um, uh, we can make the following, we can make the following definition. So um, if you have a, a positive geometry, then you call it a simplex if it has no zeros, if the canonical form has no zeros. So, um, so and this agrees in the polytope case with what a, what a simplex is. And in that case, the canonical form we think of as easy because 
um, it's you just need to know what the uh, you know what the denominator is, and there's no numerator. There is still a constant, um, and and it is painful to figure out. Sergey asked if this is the same as asking for the positive part to be a curved simplex, and I don't know how to. I don't know how to phrase curve simplex. For example, the total non-negative Grassmannian satisfies this condition. The total non-negative Grassmannian has a canonical form that has no zeros, but the face post set of the total non-negative Grassmannian is extremely complicated and doesn't look like a usual simplex. Yes. Jake's question is whether uh, a positive geometry interacts well with blowing up part of the uh, boundary. That's a good question that I thought about before and I don't know. Um, uh, so in the case of, uh, in the case of toric varieties, you can, you can blow up and get other toric varieties and it works fine and there's, um, it, it's compatible. Um, in general, I'm not sure. Yeah, so, so one hope to, so one open problem is to find formally for this and uh, one formula uh, is to use triangulations. And so the question is, can you get, can you find triangulations of these, uh, these examples? Um, so actually most of the, so the toric variety example and, and a simplex uh, and the total negative Grassmannian satisfy this. M0 n bar doesn't satisfy this. It actually has zero somewhere else on M0 n bar. Um, but the other thing you can try to do is to try to uh, get a formula looking like this for the other examples. And the thing that makes this hard is that there's an operation due in this uh, formula. And, um, and outside, of, um, outside of sort of uh, uh, sets inside a Euclidean space, uh, we don't have a good notion of due. So, but that's the that's another the other question is sort of um, yes when does a formula looking like that work um, uh, so does do so I think I actually think the answer is negative for most of them so I I'll ask which uh, positive geometries have dues so this is a vague question but to be a do to be a do you need some formula looking like this to work. And there are indications of an existence of a dual. And the indication of an existence of a dual is that is a feature of the um, canonical form of the polytope, which is that this, this canonical form, thinking of it, let's say, as a rational function, this function is positive in the interior of the polytope by definition. Um, and so a way to say it is that the, the, the form, the form is, uh, has constant sign within the interior of the polytope. Um, and, uh, and some positive geometries have this feature and some positive geometries do not. The positive geometries that have this feature we call positively convex. So towards this goal, um, we make this definition, um, x squared than zero years, positively convex if the, uh, the canonical form is a constant sign on the interior of the geometry. And that is true for actually um, all the examples uh, I gave, um, but uh, it is not true in general for, for this example. Um, and, but it is a conjecture for uh, this, uh, this statement, here's a conjecture for um, a particular amphitohedron. It's not even um, a, uh, expected to be true for all amphitohedra, but for amphitohedra in, in the physical range, um, this has been tested numerically. And so we expect um, some, when, when we have uh, this positivity property, then we can hope for a volume of dual kind of formula. Okay, so um, I guess I have a, 
five minutes to talk about, um, I had two other directions that I wanted to, to mention, um, but let's. So the, the next topic was um, about combinatorics, combin let's say combinatorial topology. And so the, the problem is, um, if I know something is a positive geometry, what can I say about the face poset, which I get from doing this recursive boundary um, operation? And what can I say about the topology of the space? Uh, no, yeah, I, I, I actually, um, so the question was, do I meant topology of the face poset? I actually meant topology of, of this um, and, and of this, but, but yes, yeah, so also um, I want to know about the topology of the face poset as well. And um, somewhat surprisingly in the examples that we have, um, in a lot of them, we've managed to prove pretty strong results about the topology of the uh, face poset and, and uh, the, the face poster and the topology of the space itself. So, for example, if P is a polytope, then, uh, then we know what the topology is. The interior of a polytope is an open ball. The whole polytope is a closed ball. Uh, so let's say um, homeomorphic to a closed ball. Um, and the, the face poset of a polytope is obviously a prototype for the nicest kinds of posets that we have. Um, so, uh, um, so face poset is, is uh, Eulerian, shellable, and, and all, all the things that we associate to nice posets. Um, and uh, there's, it turns out that these statements are also true for the total non-negative Grossmannian and similar and some similar examples. Um, so um, these are so true for total non-negative Grossmannian. So the closed boy is a result of mine with uh, Pasha Galashin and Stephen Kaff, and the and the shellability is a result of Williams in this case. And there are other examples that uh, we that we expect to sort of belong to this uh, um, uh, family of uh, um, spaces. Um, uh, for example, um, compactifications of the space of electrical networks, planar Ising models, where um, some uh, variants of these results are known. And um, what's uh, one one question is um, uh, whether whether the existence and uniqueness of this canonical form can be tied to these properties. So um, one of the so one reason why you might expect that there's a relationship between these properties and the existence of the canonical form is the canonical form says they exist unique, which sounds like a sphere. A sphere has a unique top class, and uh, the canonical form says there is a unique solution to some kind of equation. And so so there is some uh, uh, potential that the combinatorial properties and the topological properties of positive geometries can be tied to the definition. But currently we don't, uh, we don't have a mechanism of doing this. Um, uh, so all the natural examples uh, that we know of um, uh, actually satisfy these, uh, these conditions. So there are some, as I said, there are some examples where I take a disjoint union of some positive geometries and so on. Um, but the, the, all the natural examples that we know are sort of conjecturally have these properties and we're not completely sure why. Um, so just to, just to finish, um, I, I feel like I, I should mention um, sort of really the original motivations for defining a positive geometry, which is from physics. Um, so, so the, should say just maybe a couple of sentences about original motivation is that if you give me a differential form, the natural thing to do with a differential form is to integrate it. And actually we're given two things. We're given a cycle and a differential form. So there is, we can try to do the following thing. 
And this is this guy is a manifold that's d dimensional. This is a d form, so this integral could potentially make sense. However, this integral usually does not converge. And the reason it doesn't converge is we force this differential form to have simple poles as I approach the boundary of this. So this guy has logarithmic divergence, basically in all the directions as I approach the as I approach a pole. And um, in depending on where we use the positive geometry, it turns out that um, this can be fixed by adding a regulator, and the regulator depends on the application. So um, the original uh, the original application is we take uh, a which is an amphitohedron, and then we take the um, amphitohedron form, and then what we do is we add some delta functions, which I won't explain. Oh, what that means. Um, and uh, another example, which is actually the reason um, I introduced the uh, M0N example is if we take um, uh, uh, the canonical form of M0N, um, and then we take the cycle to be the positive part of uh, uh, M0N, that this, this gives the function that appeared in Hugh Thomas's talk, which is the string amplitude. As long as we put we put an appropriate um, factor here, which I guess I'll I'll, I'll write um, so it has notation looking like this. It turns out that for some appropriate uh, appropriate exponents here, this this turns out to converge, and this thing is called the string amplitude. Um, um, and um, there are other examples of um, integrals that uh, um, that um, appear. Um, one, one example comes from mirror symmetry. The, um, this canonical form in the positive part also allows us to write integral functions that are solutions to quantum differential equations for Grassmannians, for example. Um, and, uh, and very recently, these kinds of integrals of this type um, have been matched in the work of Stumfels and Talon to There's a, there's a large family of examples uh, of integrals that come from, that use this canonical form. And, but we don't have, uh, we ha don't have a good theory of, um, of uh, sort of um, the relationship between the different examples. So they, these examples come up for different positive geometries and we use slightly different regulators to regulate our integral. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's an open problem to sort of unify all of these uh, uh, diverse applications. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk, Thomas. Are there any questions? Yes. So the question is whether the image of a positive geometry under a certain kind of morphism should also be a positive geometry. That's a good question. I think I've certainly thought a lot about it, and that's the way we think about triangulating Grassmann polytopes and amplitohedra. However, I don't think that it can hold um, sort of super generally with no assumptions. I, I, I worry that um, th there's a condition that basically all the, all the boundary components that you meet have to be geometric genus zero. So you can't see an elliptic curve anywhere. And I worry that you could make an example um, like that by choosing a morphism. Um, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Yes. Uh, I can mention uh, like a simple natural problem, which is kind of partially open, because of the knowledge about it. 
But, yeah, uh, go ahead. Go uh, ahead, please. So, but uh, basically, Th Thomas on purpose was sloppy. Uh, well, Thomas, well, I don't want to hijack. Uh, but Thomas on purpose was a little bit sloppy about the science of canonical form. But if you don't want to be sloppy, so you, uh, so here's a problem, for example, about cluster algebras. Suppose you want to assign, you have a collection of a cluster and some ordering of cluster variables in a cluster. And you want to define the sign that changes every time then you switch to clusters and every time then you mutate. So that's exactly what happens with the canonical form. So can you kind of give a non-recursive rule uh, for this sign? And in some cases, for example, like again, make, can make signs for cluster algebras of type, finite type. So in type A, we know how to do it, but maybe for other. So I, I think I think for cluster algebras, we we do know uh, how to do oh, it. So you know uh, because yes. uh, mm. uh, okay. what you do is you have the G vector fan, and um, and you. Uh, if you give me a cluster and I want a canonical ordering of the cluster variables, I take the corresponding G vector uh, cone inside the G vector space. I fix an orientation on the G vector space. This gives me an orientation on that cone, and that will give me an ordering of the cluster variables, which gives a compatible sign. Mm -hmm. So just because all the, yeah, the, so I mean, it, it's just, I'm thinking of the normal fan to an associohedron, and that and the ambient space of the normal fan to the associohedron has an orientation. I use that orientation on each cone. Yes. Um, so uh, this uh, so this talk is based upon my work with Nima Akani Hamed and Yan Tao Bai. Um, uh, and we wrote a pretty long paper, I forget, which is called Positive Geometries and Canonical Forms. Um, yes. Um, so, do you get a sample of not positively convex, but positive geometries when you take generic affine hyper plane arrangement and you take a map of complex? Um, so the, the question is um, about uh, positive geometries that aren't positively convex. So the simplest kind of examples I have, I don't know if it's, uh, yes, of the type that you're thinking about is like this. So um, uh, this, so the, the canonical form has a pole along the, this line. And so it changes sign as you cross this in the interior. And so this, uh, this non-convex uh, quadrilateral uh, is a positive geometry that is not positively convex. And it, it doesn't have a good notion of dual. So that, that's, that's where our intuition comes from. Yes. Uh, the question is whether for um, uh, yes, how close positive, how close convexity is related to positive convexity, and um, uh, it, it's it's not exactly the same, and I um, we don't know exactly the relation. So certainly, if you have a non-convex, if you have a non-convex polygon, then it's not positively convex. Um, if you have a convex polytope, then it's positively convex. Uh, you can make things like this, the union of two uh, closed interval, and, and, and there's some telescoping sum calculation to do. This turns out to be positively convex. Um, we're not, uh, yeah, so we don't, uh, we could restrict to connected, uh, also connected uh, positive geometries, and, and um, yeah, I, we, we, we don't have any results about that. Yes, yes. So, so. Well, I, 
I guess it depends. Uh, I mean, what's the definition of a non convex polytope? So, what? Uh, oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you again, Thomas, for a great talk.